The Silosaurids were weird, and whenever we talk about the first dinosaurs, the Silosaurs need to be included, because they may or may not have been some of the first dinosaurs. Which, even if they weren't, they're still super, super closely related. So again, still super important for understanding the story of how dinosaurs came to be. The proportions all seem almost dinosaur-y, but slightly off, like an alternate reality dinosaur. It's kind of weird. There's a new one coming from the Carnian stage of the Triassic in Brazil. And the Triassic is when dinosaurs and the Silosaurs all evolved. And this is actually really interesting because, again, you're getting these major radiations of dinosaurs that we're seeing in other groups. For example, from the same or similar beds, at least, in Brazil, where this fossil comes from, you have things like sauropodomorphs, some of which would become the sauropods, the big, long-necked plant eaters. You have some herrerasaurs, which are pretty closely related to the theropods, so, you know, the big meat-eating ones. But you don't really have anything that's super closely related to the Ornithischian dinosaurs. And that's pretty true of the entire Triassic. The Ornithischians are really well-known dinosaurs like Triceratops or Parasaurolophus. It's a lot of the plant-eating ones that aren't the sauropods. And so again, they got all around the world, they're really well-known, but for some reason we don't have any fossils of them during the Triassic, or at least not anything that's very definitively them. There's one fossil, Pisanosaurus, which might be, but it's super partial. Many of these early dinosaur fossils actually do come from South America as well, and it's not just them. Some of the first Ligurpetids also come from South America. The Ligurpetids are the closest relatives to the pterosaurs, so the flying, not dinosaurs, but relatives of dinosaurs, that lived during the same time. So it's a really good piece of evidence that this group of reptiles that would come to dominate the planet for over 150 million years really got their start in South America. And with the Silosaurs, we have at least some evidence now that it may have also been what led up to the Ornithischians also doing the same thing. Ammonosaurus nesbidae is the new one, and it's super, super partial still. There's the top of a femur and the bottom of a femur, and it seems like the femurs are different sizes, so it's two individuals, but it is really interesting because of what it can tell us about the Silosaurs, and also one specific feature in how the Silosaurs related to the dinosaurs, and specifically Ornithischians. First, most Silosaurs were much smaller than the other animals in their environment. For example, take Silosaurus, which is from Poland. And while it's there and it's pretty small, you have much larger predators like smock, as well as very large herbivores like Lizobichia. Now, Ammonosaurus wasn't actually that big, but compared to the other dinosaurs that have come from the same rocks, like Buriolestes, it's pretty comparable. And again, these aren't going to be super huge animals, but it's at least significant that compared to the relatives that were around at the same time, it was similarly sized. It wasn't only just dwelling under the feet of much larger animals. But the size of the bone isn't the most important part of it. Instead, the most important part of it is probably the small cleft on the front side of the upper femur. This is a kind of cleft that we actually see in Ornithischian dinosaurs to help separate out where certain muscle attachments go. And the thing is, there's one other Silosaurid, UC Lephysis, which also has this but comes from later and has been debated what exactly that animal was. Meanwhile, later you get to things like Scatellosaurus, which is from the early Jurassic and is definitely an Ornithischian, and you can see how developed that cleft is. There's been a growing body of evidence that the Silosaurs aren't really a clade in and of themselves, meaning a separate family that's entirely distinct from the other dinosaurs or dinosaur relatives, but instead they kind of make up this grade that eventually leads into the Ornithischians. And this animal actually really helps to support that idea. I mean that when we look at the various fossils that we have in South America of this kind of related group of animals, we can start to understand more how the evolution of these groups actually took place. When you start, you have the Silosaurs and the Aphanosaurs, which the Aphanosaurs were this weird group of dinosaur relatives which went extinct during the Middle Triassic, so they weren't around long and didn't really have much influence on the rest of us. But then you get a gap in the early Carnian, and this section of rock really hasn't been studied as well, so there's probably more fossils there we could find, but they're just not there yet. And then after that, you get most of the groups that are related to dinosaurs. So for example, you get the Ligurpetids, which again, related to the pterosaurs, which aren't dinosaurs, but related. And then you get the Silosaurs, which likely led to the Ornithischians, Sauropodomorpha, which led to the Eusauropods, which were the largest animals to ever walk the planet, and the Herrerasaurs, which may have directly led to theropods, but regardless, they got replaced by the theropods during the later Triassic. All of this together paints a very kind of mosaic picture of the evolution of these groups during the late Triassic. 
There wasn't one kind of single system that worked throughout the world, with Xylosaurus being much smaller. Instead, it was a much more dynamic environment and diversification of these groups. And we can tell all of that just because we found a couple more pretty small fossils. So it really is important to document everything you can.